So this is the first time in this building this week that I'm addressing all of you, but for those who went to the karaoke bar, this is not the first time where I've been on a stage with a microphone looking at you guys. Um, this, what I'm talking about, my time on the battlefield, I think they, they picked this for me because I've been out recently and engaged in several debates uh, with, with various people of different schools of thought. And so I think the, the idea is that you know, you're, you're all here this week sort of learning the, the theory, but then you're going to have to go out in the world and, and apply it. So I, I don't know if you guys, I've been reading a lot of Harry Potter with my young son, and so if you're familiar with that series, I guess this is more like the Defense Against the Dark Arts class where I'm going to be. Um, I didn't know if that joke was going to work or not. All right. Because now Seinfeld references are too old, apparently. I've, I've learned that with the younger crowd. Like, Who's that? Okay, so um, like I say, I'll, so I'm going to walk through, and I'm going to try to give you a little flavor of, of both. On the one hand, just telling you how these things happened and what, and what transpired, but also, and then talking about a little bit of the flavor of the, the content involved, just you know, sort of some of the stuff is, that you're not going to get during this week in any other lecture, so I'll just bring up some of these things. But then also, if there's any chance for me to explain you know, why it went well or why, in retrospect, I should have done things differently. So I'm going to give you that sort of feedback also. So the first one I'm going to talk about is I had a debate with this guy, Carl Smith, who's a new Keynesian economist, a super nice guy and everything. And this was hosted a few years ago on the Mises Academy site. And so we actually, it was like it was a pay-per-view event. We charged admission and everything. And, uh, and he, you know, talked to his fans and I talked to my fans and we got everyone to come and, uh, and so we, he was a good sport about it, and it was, in my opinion, this was, of all the things I'm going to talk about, this was the best debate in terms of just each side presenting its position and not mischaracterizing the other one. I also like this one because everyone agreed I won this particular debate, so it was a, a special place in my heart. But um, even Carl said that to, on his blog later. He, he wasn't conceding that he was wrong in the, in the issues, but he was saying that, yeah, I, I didn't win that debate. Bob did. Um, so the title of that is Government Spending Can Play an Important Role in Boosting Economic Growth. If you're curious and you want to watch it on YouTube, that's the, the, you know, the YouTube title. And uh, when I was going into this, Gary North actually emailed me shortly before the debate occurred, and he gave me two bits of advice. He said, first of all, decide beforehand who your audience is. Are you trying to convince academics or are you trying to convince the layperson? You just, he said, you can't just flounder. You have to decide going into it who your audience is going to be, and then make sure that you cater to that style. Don't just flip back and forth, because then you might end up you know, not persuading anybody. So I think that was a good piece of advice. His other bit of advice was, don't lose. <laughs> and that's also important. And, and he was even elaborating and saying that, you know, because you know, I'm more known than this guy was in these certain circles, and so like, it would look bad. You know, if, if I beat him, no big deal. If he beat me, it would be catastrophic. And so he was saying, don't lose. And it's, it's sort of, I mean, yes, sir, okay, you know, made me study more before going into that thing. Um, and that's, that's true in general. I just, you, you might you know, think about, we're, as Austrian, fans of the Austrian school and libertarians, obviously, anytime we do something, then that's going to reflect on us because we're in a minority viewpoint, and our opponents are certainly not uh, afraid to take something that, strictly speaking, has nothing to do with the content of our ideas and then use that to discredit the school so just keep that in mind also. I mean, even when you're here in Auburn, you know, you're here with the Institute and you kind of, rep, you know, represent us when you're out in the community, you know, make sure you don't get in bar fights, stuff like that. And if you should get arrested this week and the cop says to you, you're clearly not from around here, what brings you to Auburn? You say, I'm here for an economics conference taught by Paul Krugman. That's what you're telling me. <laughs> I mean, you write that down. It's important. Okay, so what were some of the issues that uh, came up in this particular debate with Carl Smith? So he brought up the, so he was trying to justify when it could be advantageous for the federal government to engage in deficit spending. So let me just very quickly give you that position to make sure you're aware of it, because that's another thing too, if you're going to go out and debate with Keynesians and things, you should at least be aware of what their standard position is, so you don't come off as if you're just reflecting what they used to say in the 1950s, for example. So the modern new Keynesian a uh, sophisticated argument for deficit spending goes like this. They say, in general, so, so first of all, what, what's a recession in, in the modern sense of the word for them? It's when there's a shortfall in aggregate demand, and so there's not enough spending, either investment or consumption, in order to, for businesses to be willing to hire enough workers to achieve full employment. So the issue is, how do we stimulate more spending? And, they, and the, the new Keynesian will say, 
normally you don't need fiscal policy. Fiscal being when the government spending and taxation decisions. It can all be done through monetary policy. In the US, it's the Federal Reserve just cuts interest rates and then at lower interest rates, that makes businesses want to borrow and invest more and it makes consumers more willing to, to spend more. They don't want to save as much the lower the interest rate gets pushed, other things equal. And so that normally you just, the Fed just keeps lowering interest rates until you have uh, restored aggregate demand to where it needs to be to ensure full employment. But they say uh, in certain situations, sometimes like in the present situation, the nominal interest rate, meaning the actual market r rate, you know, not adjusted for price inflation, if that gets down close to zero, then the Fed can't push it any lower than that. Because nobody, what would it mean to have a negative nominal rate? That would mean you'd lend out $100 today and then get paid back like $95 a year from now. So nobody would ever agree to that because you'd be better just sitting on your cash and then having earning a 0% nominal rate of return. So the, when you hit what the Keynesians call the zero lower bound, or something they just abbreviated ZLB, they're saying then it, it's not advantageous, or the Fed kind of runs out of traction. It can't push nominal rates lower, so it can't stimulate spending in the present anymore by working through interest rates. And so they say that opens the door for the efficacy of uh, fiscal policy. So now, in order to stimulate aggregate demand, the federal government should run a budget deficit. So that's the, the, the standard new Keynesian way of justifying deficit spending. And so they'll, I'm just bringing that up partly because they'll say, don't accuse us of always favoring deficit spending. No, we don't. It's only under these certain circumstances, namely when uh, interest rates are basically zero. So that was one thing he brought up. Another um, issue he brought up was he, he was saying, look, at, there's this thing called the output gap. And that's if you look at you know, the CBO and these other government places will estimate the trend in GDP. So, you know, if you're picturing a chart from your point of view, like here's GDP is going like this, and they call it potential GDP, and they go up an upward trend, and then actual GDP falls off a cliff right around 2008. And so they're looking at that gap between the two lines. And he's saying there's nothing, you know, it's not like all of our physicists died. It's not like all of our engineers suddenly had a heart attack in 2008. It's not like there was an explosion in the factories. It's not like a comet hit. And so there's nothing that happened to our infrastructure, our physical ability to create goods and services. Nothing seemed to change from you know, 2007 into 2008, and yet the actual output fell. And you see workers sitting at home watching you know, Maury Povich or whatever the shows are now, and instead of going in the factory, and you see it's not just that the workers are unemployed, but the factories are running at 70% also. So there's all these what's called idle resources He's saying, so, you know, clearly there's a role for if the government comes in and starts deficit spending and puts these people back to work, there's no opportunity cost, or there's very little opportunity cost because we're basically just sucking all of these people and inanimate resources that right now are doing nothing back into producing things. So how could that be bad? So that you could see where he's coming from from that perspective. Okay, so um, I made a few points, but let me just summarize two of them for you. So one is I said... Let's first of all just to try to understand the debates between the people arguing for government intervention, specifically deficit spending during times of recession, versus the people that say, no, that's going to be a bad idea. Uh, let's for a second switch analogies and, or switch context and use an analogy from the medical field. And suppose there's some you know, patients that have a certain kind of illness, and there's one group of doctors, and they say, we recommend this medicine X, this new, new form of medicine. And every time they give it to these patients, the patients always get sicker, right? And now so that would seem to be, and these other group of doctors are saying, no, that's actually poison, it's not medicine. And see, they're always getting sicker. It's not a coincidence that whenever you have a patient who received the biggest dose of that thing you're calling medicine, that, that substance X, that patient is the sickest we've ever seen. All right, now, the, uh, so th that right there is not, prove it one way or the other. So really what would happen is the first, because there's what's called um, you know, issues of correlation versus causation, and it's possible that they say, well, yeah, but we only ever recommend these, this particular medicine to somebody who's already sick, who has this condition. It's not like we just grab people off the street and randomly give them this thing. And so you know, just like you wouldn't say necessarily, oh, hospitals are really bad for you because look at how many people die in hospitals. See what I'm saying? Like hospitals are far more dangerous than amusement parks because looking at it over time, 
Clearly more people die in hospitals than amusement parks, right? So that you could see how the, the danger in, in reasoning that way. So that's what the defenders of this medicine would do. But okay, take it one more step. You just come back and say, all right, fine, you're right. It doesn't prove it. It's just prima facie evidence that maybe this, this substance is, is harming people. So how would you want to do it? You would want to go and, and do a bunch of controlled studies, ideally. You'd want to take thousands of people who had this condition or this sickness, whatever it is, and then give some of them the, the standard treatment and then give other ones this new substance X and then look between those two groups and try to control as much as possible to keep it apples to apples and then see what happens. So yeah, you don't want to compare it to people from the general population, but you'd want to look at it that way. And if, if it still turned out, even within those subsamples that will know the people who got the, the substance X ended up doing worse than the people who didn't, then surely you would start to come around to our perspective that that stuff is poison. And at the very least, what you couldn't do, what would be crazy, is if you pointed at a patient who started out kind of sick, you gave them the medicine, or substance X, they got even sicker, in fact, got worse than you thought upon your initial diagnosis, and then you come back and say, Phew, it's a good thing we gave them substance X because this person was sicker than we realized. You see what I'm saying? That that would be a completely legitimate move. It, it might be correct, but sh surely the burden of proof would be on you, and you'd need to use other evidence to establish the potency of this thing as medicine. So I walked through that, and then I applied it to the debates over what's called stimulus spending versus what's been called austerity, and it dovetails pretty nicely that there are countless countries, and you know, different, not just the US, but all over you know, Europe and so forth, throughout the decades of the 20th century, a lot of data points of countries that were in the midst of a bad recession, and they were, their governments were running big budget deficits, partly because tax revenues fall, and then what did they do? They cut spending, and that's the way they tried to get out of it, and they recovered you know, a few years later, and it was fine, and then we, we don't even worry about that anymore. There's plenty of cases like that, what, what's been called expansionary austerity in the, in the mainstream literature, and I said, on the contrary, I don't know of a single success story that the Keynesians point to. If you ask them and say, when did your idea work? When was there a bad economy? And then the government came in and spent enough in order to jumpstart it out of it, to my knowledge, they still can't point to a single one. That, you know, they can, what they'll do is they'll use a counterfactual. They'll say that, oh, uh, you know, like the, in 2009, without the Obama stimulus package, things would have been even worse. And so there, that's an example of success. But you see that, no, you, don't, you can't use that. It actually, things got worse, and they try to justify it by saying, well, the economy was worse than we realized. And so it's a good thing we had that stimulus. Can you imagine unemployment would have been 20%? if we hadn't run up a big budget deficit. So that's um, the, the point I was making there. As far as the output gaps, uh, that concept, here I, I got a little fanciful and I said, okay, let's imagine a silly little thought experiment, but just to make my point here, suppose everyone goes to bed one night and enters these magic gnomes, and during the middle of the night, they take all of the capital equipment in the country and rearrange it, right? So they take all the cows that are on you know, farms and they put them on Wall Street, and they take all the computers and stuff from Wall Street, and they move it to Iowa, all right? And all the hammers now are all over, distributed uniformly around the country, and the nails are all up in Alaska, things like that, all right? So everyone wakes up at eight o'clock the next morning, and they go to, start to go to work, and I'm saying, in terms of the type of aggregate statistics that Carl Smith was pointing to, would you, did the capital stock go down? Well, no, not really, not, not in terms of aggregate you know, how much, what's, what's capital K in the U.S. economy right now? It's the same thing. It's just they change the locations around it. In, in a Keynesian model, the location of a particular capital good, I mean, that's far too fine of a distinction to even get into the model because those models are so crude and they're aggregated. So I was saying in that world, what would happen, obviously, actual output of real goods and services would collapse. Like a lot of people would probably starve to death pretty soon, right? The, the machines would, start, would stop running and so forth. The, uh, you know, the farmers would go out to milk the cows and there would be a bunch of supercomputers sitting there, right? And the people would go into Wall Street to do their derivatives trading and there'd be a bunch of cows going to the bathroom on the floor, right? So what would they do? So you can see actual output would collapse. And in that context, you know, there'd be a big output gap because the CBO would still be drawn, you know, the, the upward trend of, of output. And you can just, you can see how there would, I mean, they, they would, they can theoretically handle that and they would say, oh, well, it was a supply shock and therefore, you know, the trend line of potential GDP should shift downward. But my point was, 
the Austrian diagnosis of what actually happened during the housing bubble and collapse was to say there was malinvestment and so the capital structure, the structure of production got um, disarranged and so it no longer meshed, you know, the, the, whole, the pieces were no longer sustainable and coordinated in terms of the stages of production, the way that Roger Garrison would go through in his PowerPoint in terms of a Hayekian triangle. Once you understand the, the rudiments of that approach, you can see how things can get out of whack. And so if the Austrians were right, and that is what happened, well then it was impossible. They could not, the economy was not physically capable of cranking out goods and services at the same rate as it had been doing the, the few years prior to that because it was, it was using up intermediate goods and not replacing them in the right combinations. And so the capital structure became more and more unsustainable. So there had to be a, a drop in output while things were reconfigured. So that's, that's the analogy I used to show. And so obviously in that silly little gnome thought experiment, it would be ridiculous if somebody said, well, we just need the government to run big deficits in order to jumpstart production because you know, for some reason people are afraid to spend. You can see that, you know, that would clearly be the wrong diagnosis. Okay, let's move on. Um, another thing I took part in, it was not a face-to-face -face debate, but it, it has been called the great debt debate of 2012. Just called that by me, so um, <laughs> it's true to say it has been called. Um, and in this one, so if you're interested, I'm, I'll give you a little flavor of what the main issue was, but then if you want to read more, I wrote a very long one-act play entitled The Economist Zone on my blog. So if you Google The Economist Zone Murphy, you'll probably get it. It'll be one of the top hits. Um, and it was, I was, it was riffing on the Twilight Zone. So the point was there was a, a guy in the, in the story who goes through and encounters all the arguments from the various economists, and by the end, He's, he's driven crazy. And so it was like a Twilight Zone episode. So that was the, uh, the premise of that. And, and there's links in the thing that I wrote you know, to the various people so you can, if you really want to go and backtrack and see the, the various sides of the debate. Um, Alex Tabarak uh, from GMU, when I, I sent this piece to a few economists to say, hey, I know sometimes this stuff gets in the weeds and you know people are arguing about something, but this is actually pretty important. So here's the, a summary of what happened. I encourage you to look at this. And he wrote back and said, Bob, that was truly brilliant. And I've always liked Alex from that point. But um, <laughs> he's a good guy. OK, so what, what was, the, what was the, uh, the, the debate under issue here? So the problem, was, and this is something that I actually changed my mind on it. So the Paul Krugman and, um, well, it was actually Dean Baker originally, who he's got this website with a cute name called Beat the Press. And, you know, instead of Meet the Press, it's called Beat the Press. And so this guy, Dean Baker, who's a big Keynesian economist, uh, will just find news articles where he thinks people in the mainstream media are saying silly things, uh, not fully appreciating the, the insights of Keynesian economics. So that, but that's why, just as an aside, you know how people who are like fans of Ron Paul get so frustrated at the mainstream media. Everyone hates the mainstream media. Even the, the Keynesians hate them, too. So it's... It just goes around. Um, so anyway, so that, that's the premise of his website, Beat the Press, and he was going through. And so there was one guy, I think it was David Brooks, but I'm not certain about that, that had written some op-ed just matter-of-factly claiming that, you know, one of the drawbacks of these large government deficits, so this was a few years ago when the deficit was bigger, um, one of the drawbacks of these things is that we are, you know, leaving a, a bigger burden to our grandchildren instead of dealing with our political problems or economic problems like adults ourselves, and we're, we're sh shifting it off onto our grandkids and having them deal with it. He said something like that. And that's very typical language for people when they're talking about government deficits. So the idea is if you run up a gov government deficit today, it's like the present generation is enriching itself, benefiting from that spending, assume for the minute that you thought it was good for the government to spend money, and then it's passing the bill on, you know, not to today's taxpayers, but to taxpayers who haven't been born yet. So that, that's the, the premise of this colloquial uh, commentary. So Dean Baker went nuts and was saying, this is just fundamentally stupid. This is totally wrong. And then Paul Krugman picked it up and amplified it. So let me just summarize what they're saying. The problem with that is they're saying, look, real, th there's not time machines. It's, if, if, we're, if the government right now runs a big deficit in order to give uh, health care treatment to senior citizens and it, can't, it doesn't want to raise taxes, and so it just borrows the money and that's how it pays for it, 
look, it's not like we're literally using a time machine to grab uh, MRI machines and things from the future and bring them to the present. Clearly, output decisions today are just rearranging how resources today are being used. And so in a certain sense, the, the present generation is always paying for present output, whether it's taxpayers or people that are lending the government the money. You know, the, the lenders are restricting consumption in order to be able to buy government bonds and to finance the deficit. And then another way of seeing it is to say, it's crazy to just look at the, the government debt that's getting passed down to our grandkids because you know, they're thinking, oh, well, my grandkids get born and start growing up and become taxpayers now a lot of their effort is gonna be taxed just to service the, make the interest payments on this humongous government debt that's that much bigger because we ran big deficits today. And so Krugman and Baker were pointing out, but wait a minute, there's other, I mean, it might not be the same people, but there's other grandkids that are gonna be alive and they would have inherited the government bonds. They're gonna be the people receiving those interest payments at that time. So it's, they're saying, yes, there could be distributional impacts from running a bigger deficit versus a smaller one today, but in terms of just looking at our grandkids who are going to be alive in 100 years, it's just a shell game. It's just, you know, the government might tax some of them to make interest payments to other ones, but the future generation as a whole is not going to be impoverished by that, except if you get into issues about, you know, if you raise taxes, then people don't work as much and that kind of thing. But in terms of just the, the payment itself, the payment of, in, of uh, interest payments on the debt, that per se is just a distributional issue. So that was their position, and I actually thought that that was right, and that it, and that, yeah, the real issue of government deficits is that it crowds out private investment and so on. That, it, in other words, the, the problem is, I, th I thought, when a private investor lends $1,000 to the government so they can run a deficit payment, um, then that private investor can lend it to private business. And so what ends up, so yeah, we make the future poorer because we bequeath to them a smaller capital stock. So that, that's what I was thinking. So that's still true, what I just said, that mechanism is still there, and that is a problem with government deficit spending because it crowds out private investment, and then if you, if you don't think that the government spends money as wisely as people in the private sector do, you can see why that would make our descendants poor. But in the course of this debate, it was um, Don Boudreau at GMU brought it up, and he was citing uh, James Buchanan's work to say, well, no, you guys are just wrong. There is a very legitimate sense in which government deficits today make our descendants poorer through a direct mechanism. And then this guy, Nick Rowe in Canada, also kept harping on that. And so I realized they were right, and so then I jumped in and was really trying to clarify. And it's, um, anyway, so a lot of us became, I'll tell you in a second, the, in, the intuition of it, but it was like the three of us versus the world for a while, and then I think we ended up convincing a lot of people, or at least to see that, oh, wait a minute, this is a lot more nuanced and so if you wanted to still agree with Krugman and Baker, it was for a more subtle reason than you originally would have thought, put it that way. And so it got to be a, got some publicity. Um, the Economist magazine even linked to you know, this particular thing that I, I pointed out, the Economist Zone, because it was just a good summary of, of the back and forth. So the intuition, I hope I did a good job of at least making the Krugman-Baker position plausible so you could see where they were coming from, but that's wrong because they're implicitly, when they're thinking like that, they're assuming everybody, every generation just is, is alive and then dies and there's a new generation. So if you're just thinking about, okay, we're all alive right now, we're the current generation, we run up big deficits, so some of us lend money and some of us consume, and then we all die and then give the bonds, the treasury bonds to the next generation, and now the government taxes half of them to give money to the other half, well then it looks like a big wash. And then it just seems like you know every generation just it's per capita output and consumption is whatever the physical resources are, and clearly pieces of government paper don't affect physical resources. But the problem is, um, generate. it's not like that, that if you, instead you picture it that right now there's old people who are alive and young people, and the old people are gonna benefit from deficit spending, and the young people finance it by you know, buying government bonds, the young people's right now, their consumption goes down, and then if time passes, now when the government taxes the new young people to pay off the bondholders, it's not really just a wash in that sense because the, the young people, or sorry, the, the old people now who are being paid off, they're just being made whole from the, the loans they made before. And so really what can happen, if you just think about that, I'll just say it again, it's like today, if the government taxes the current workers, or sorry, borrows, 
a trillion dollars from the current workers to give a handout to the old people, like in medical care, whatever, and then they, the old people die off and now, 50 years from now, the government comes and taxes the new young people, the grandkids, to pay off the bondholders. There's a very legitimate sense in which today's old people benefited at the expense of those future grandkids who had no say in the matter. They weren't even alive when these decisions were made, even if you believe in democracy. They had no vote in the matter. They get born and grow up in a world in which they have you know, a trillion dollars plus interest of their labor income taken away to be given to the, the, the people who are now the elderly at that point. So th it's, there is a very legitimate sense in which the standard man in the street saying, oh, government deficits make our grandkids poorer because we're too chicken to raise taxes today and pay for the government spending we want. There is a sense in which that's true. Because if, if it weren't true, just think about it, why is it that the government runs such a big deficit? If it, were, if it really were just a matter of redistribution, regardless of the funding mechanism, well, then how come the government chooses to finance its shortfalls in Social Security and Medicare with deficit spending? Why don't they just raise taxes on today's workers to fully cover that? And the answer is because it, that would receive howls of protest, that the people who lend money to the government today think they're going to get paid enough in the future to make it worth their while. So that's actually not involuntary in that sense. Where the involuntary coercion comes in is when the bondholders get paid off because then the taxpayers who have to be taxed to pay them off, that's not a voluntary decision, but the person who lends money to the government today thinking he's going to get paid with interest in 50 years, that, that's a voluntary decision. So that's another way of seeing it, that something's fishy here. How can it be, I mean, I, the old people today like getting the deficit spending, and the young people today voluntarily lend money to the government. So it's like there's no losers today, and then clearly down the road, the young people who are being taxed are are not benefiting from that. So there is a definite sense in which we collectively today can enrich ourselves at the expense of future generations. So it's a very subtle technical point, but it was just another, it was interesting because as, as happens so often, the standard Keynesian analysis went through because they were thinking of things in a very crude, unrealistic aggregate framework. They were just thinking of people alive today at T1 people alive at T2 and counting those as the generations and not being more realistic and saying, wait a minute, there's, you know, some people die off and then the other people are alive while new people are born and come on the scene. And once you make it a little bit more realistic, you can see that the man on the street's objection is actually perfectly valid. Okay, let me move on. Uh, another debate that I participated in, this was in June, and it was, if you go to YouTube, there's actually, this particular debate now has over 5,000 views on it. Um, it's, the title of it on YouTube is MMT versus the Austrian School Debate. So MMT stands for Modern Monetary Theory. So they, this is the guy, his name is Warren Mosler, and we had this debate at Columbia University and was hosted by, or moderated by John Carney of CNBC, if you know who that is. So here, the... Uh, now, this was one where I, I was kind of frustrated with what happened, so I'll, I'll tell you some of the debate, you know, like the, the content, and then I'll just explain what happened in terms of the debate itself. So one thing, just to warn you, according to all of Warren Mosler's fans, he pwned me, you know, the, um, <laughs> the P-W-N-E-D. I'm not sure exactly how that verb functions, but apparently I was the recipient of massive pwnage. Um, <laughs> so... On the other hand, let me just tell you that w w this young woman in, in Nashville talked to me later after she watched it, and her analysis of it went like this. She said, yeah, like throughout the debate, Moser just kept making all of these points that I thought were, like, I knew they were wrong, but they sounded like good objections to the Austrian position, and you just kept ignoring it and letting them go and focus on other stuff. And then finally, in the closing remarks, I realized all along you had just been giving him the rope that he would hang himself with. And so then she said, did you do that on purpose? And so, of course, I said yes, right? I mean, <laughs> but but in, in actuality, it was, it was on purpose that it was, if you watch the debate, you'll see, like, during it, he, he was saying some things that I knew, and I was just jotting notes saying, okay, that's the real zinger. I've got him on that point. But I just saved it for the, for the uh, closing remarks to, to get him there. So let me, um, let me first explain, the, the, like I say, the, the basic content, and then I'll talk about the, what, the flow of what actually happened in the debate. So... These guys, modern monetary theorists, they're, they have a lot of points, and if you want to read more on it, Moser's got this book that I think it's called The Seven Innocent Deadly 
economic frauds, something like that. Um, and so you can go and skim that if you want to get a flavor of where these guys are coming from. So their point is, that they're kind of, I would say, slippery, that on the one hand, they try to make it sound like all they're doing is accounting tautologies, and that no one could possibly disagree with what they're saying, and yet then they supplement them with all sorts of very radical policy proposals that would have huge economic impacts. And so it, it, you know, it, can't be, it can't be both. It can't just be you know, from mere accounting tautologies. These specific policy proposals don't just automatically pop out. So that's, but that's the rhetorical strength. And you'll see like a lot of the comments, the way a lot of the MMT fans dealt with me is they would say things like, Mosler was say, describing how the world is. Murphy was describing how he wants it to be. And, and so you know, that, that sounds very powerful. But as I pointed out in my closing remarks, well, well, no, Mosler throughout this debate has offered all sorts of specific policy proposals, things like he wanted the, the federal government to give a $10 an hour transition job to anybody who wants it. So people who are unemployed right now, the government just guarantees we will give you transition work to try to get you to go back into the private sector employment at $10 an hour to anyone who wants it. Um, he wanted to make 0% interest rates permanent because he thought um, positive interest rates were like a subsidy to the big bankers. He um, wanted unsecured, he wanted the Fed to provide unsecured bank liquidity so that you know, a given bank, if, it, if it's in a liquidity trouble, right now the Fed could, in, before making a loan to it, could say, well, let me see the collateral basis loan. And, and Mosler's position is no, FDIC already get, you know, states that these banks are fine. If they're still being allowed to operate, then they've gotten approval for the green light from FDIC, and so we don't need the Fed then on top of that to run these banks' assets and balance sheets through another micro, or a magnifying lens. And so because of that, he's saying to be consistent, the Federal Reserve should just make uh, unlimited amounts of liquidity loans to banks that request them and so forth. All right, so my point is he makes some very strong policy recommendations. So that clearly this is not just him explaining accounting to us. All right, so where he's coming from, the, the big uh, issue is the MMT people say, since governments left the gold standard, there really is no budget constraint anymore in governments, that that's not an issue, that you gotta stop thinking of governments like private households or businesses where they have an income and then they can't spend more than that, or if they do in any given period, then they need to, to borrow the difference and they have to worry about, oh my gosh, I gotta service these debt payments. Um, they're saying that's, that's completely wrong, that, that that was true under the gold standard because then there was an external constraint on the government's financing that it needed to worry about if it spent too much and couldn't raise the um, a necessary amount in taxation or borrowing, then it could, if, it, it could run out of gold reserves. By saying now, with fiat money, that's not an issue. And so, for example, when people worry about unfunded liabilities in Social Security and Medicare, that sort of thing, saying this is, it's silly to, to worry about where are we gonna get this money from, that that's the wrong way to look at it because the government can just print money. And you know, that, that's, that's no constraint. And, and then they say, now, admittedly, that, that's not a solution to everything. That, that's not that we can just do whatever we want because there is the issue of price inflation. And so, yes, in certain, so, so what they say is actually the function of taxation is not to raise revenue for the government. They say the function of taxation is to cool down aggregate demand when inflation gets too high. All right, so it's a complete reversal of the way most people think about it. So that's, that's their position. So I was trying to illustrate what I thought was wrong with that, and I said, okay, there's a sense in which what they're saying is technically true. And, and by saying that, I just, you know, all the MMT people are, oh, see, Mur Murphy said he's, he's right. And I said, but, but hang on, I said, it's true the same way that the following is true. I said, imagine there's a couple, and they're, they're meeting you know, at, the, at the dinner table, and they're looking over their finances, and it's just times are really tough, and the, and the, the wife is looking at it and saying, you know, we've, we've cut back on our expenses and we just, this ends aren't meeting here. I'm going to just take up a second job because that's the only thing I can see here and we'll have to put our kid in daycare. That, that's the only way this is going to make sense because just with your income right now, we can't afford to pay all these bills. And, you know, this, uh, this, this budget is just, just too tight. And so then the husband says, no, 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 you're thinking about this all wrong. All I have to do is put on a ski mask and go down to liquor stores and start robbing them. <laughs> all right? So this issue about we need more income is because you're, you're misdiagnosing it. Now, admittedly, if I do that too much, I might get arrested and go to prison. 
So I'm not saying you know, it's, a, it's a solve all problem approach here, but all I'm, but I'm saying is you're misdiagnosing the problem. Let's stop thinking of it in terms of we need more income. Instead, let's think of it as what's the optimal amount of my liquor store robberies, <laughs> right? So now, now again, if you say, is what that guy said wrong? And technically, no, what he said is true, but that's very, not useful at all in the discussion. And if there's a growing movement of people who keep harping on that point whenever you know, households are worried about their finances and keep saying, all I'm saying is just rob the liquor store. You know, that's, it. <laughs> that's all you got to do. And you know, then why aren't we talking about this? You know, the, that, they're not helping at all. And, they, and the, you know, the problem is they, even though technically, you know, and, and so that someone could come back and say, well, we could do that, but what are all these problems? And I say, yeah, we're not denying the, the downside of that. We're just saying that this is actually the true situation, that you have to stop thinking of it in terms of, you need an employer to voluntarily give you a paycheck to cover your bills. Don't think of it like that anymore, because that's wrong. That's, that's old school thinking. This is reality. So you can see how that would be completely unhelpful. So that's what I was saying was analogous to what Mosler was doing when he was trying to justify all of these huge new government programs and to get people to stop thinking that, oh, we have this crisis in Social Security, and we need to you know, get people to realize their benefits are going to get cut and blah, blah, blah. And he's saying, no, no, you got to stop thinking like that. It's just, you know, the government has no budget constraint. And then as an afterthought, oh, yeah, sure. I mean, there could be an issue of price inflation that I'm saying, well, no, all you've done is transfer the problem to a different area and made it that much worse because it's harder for the government, or sorry, for, harder for the public to see what's going on when prices are rising because the government's printing money, whereas if the government explicitly taxes you to pay for something, you get a, a better sense of what's going on, and the public's more uh, suspicious of that. So that, that was the point I was making there. Um, and so, you know, I thought it was a cute point, and, and Warren even chuckled. We were sitting right next to each other. So, by the way, he's an extremely charming guy beforehand. We both got there early, and he's just, like, holding court. Because he had fans show up. Like, people had MMT uh, uh, hats and so forth. And I was wishing I had brought my Bombavert T-shirts to be handing out to people. But, um, and so he, and he's a charming guy, and I'm just sitting there listening to him, and he's, like, sucking me. And I was like, wait a minute. i got to just get away and, and like, <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want this to like this guy too much. Um, and so he's a perfectly pleasant guy. And, and so then he, uh, to illustrate his viewpoint, used his own analogy that was even crazier. He was saying, he pulled out a business card, and he said, I have these business cards, Warren Moser. Now, if I just like, tried to get everyone in this room to use it as a medium of exchange, they wouldn't do it, right? Nobody cares about these business cards. But what if I told you that there's a guy outside in the hall with a gun, and he's not going to let you leave this room unless you give him one of these cards? Now I can get you to like clean my house and do all sorts of things for these cards. And that was, he was explaining the beauty of his perspective with, it, with that. <laughs> and so I was just, uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You see what I'm saying? So, and because he, and it, just in case you're not getting lost, so he's saying that because that was, that's what fiat money is. That the reason we all need to get fiat money is to pay our taxes because the government insists on payment in the form of US dollars. And so he's saying that's why ultimately everybody has to scramble for U.S. dollars. That's why they have value in exchange, and then it just spills over, and now we just use it as a medium of exchange in general because we all have to you know, get it in, because there's always that tax bill that's going to be due that's quoted in U.S. dollars. So that's where he was, that's where he was coming from with that. And, and like I said, so you can see so his followers were latching onto that and saying, yeah, see, that's a brilliant analogy, Moser. So anyway, one part that was funny in this debate is you know, after he won up the analogy, and like he, he had said something you know, that was sounded worse than, um, you know, because he was implicitly threatening everyone in the room, whereas I was just, you know, threatening these unseen liquor store owners with my analogy. And so, um, so after that, so the end of the thing that's in the Q&A, and, and I'm just bringing this up because a lot of people thought it was funny. So the, the first guy who gets it is this, this real confident, swaggering guy. He's like, Hey, uh, Dr. Murphy, Professor Murphy, I was really unhappy with your analogy. It was very rude. You're talking about liquor store robberies. And what, I think you could give more respect to Mr. Moser here. And, and so, you know, that, that was the kind of thing. And I was stunned because, like I said, Moser's own analogy was more inflammatory than mine was. And, and he chuckled. And the, and the crowd had been chuckling and everything. So, but the thing was, I knew this guy. I was like, I, that guy sounds, he seems very familiar. Who is it? And it turned out, it's, it's Mike Norman, if you guys know who that is. If you go to the Peter Schiff was right on YouTube, He's the guy, like in the second batch of clips, who, like in 2006, Peter Schiff is with a bunch of people on CNBC, and they're talking about the o prospects for the housing market in 07. 
and the one guy says, oh, I think prices are going to go up 10%. Peter Schiff is up, and he gives his real bearish thing. And then this guy, Mike Norman, comes up, and he goes, I don't have any idea what Peter Schiff is talking about. What are you talking about? Oh, you know, low standards for lending. What are you, crazy? And so it was, it was, it was that, uh, that guy whose confidence has not been diminished in any way since that episode. <laughs> so anyway. So I guess, in, in part, but like I say, it kind of threw me. So I guess one, th one thing is from, from that episode is you, you got to just go into it knowing that, like I said, also with, with Mosler's approach, which you'll see if you watch it, I was all prepared and I, ha I had read his book and everything and I was, so I had all sorts of analogies tied to, you know, to and, I, and we had questions that we did and that's partly what this young lady meant when she said at first she couldn't see what I was doing and then realized later it was like a rope-a-dope strategy where I was, I was getting Mosler to admit things in the Q&A and then I wasn't you know, pursuing it. I was just saying, okay, and I was just jotting down what his answer was and then it wasn't until the, the conclusion that I then explained, he said this, this, and this, so therefore, and, and you know, that was my, my strategy. But the, the, the difficulty was, I had to, he never really explained where he was coming from. He just started out the opening listing, I think, nine or 10 of his proposals without giving any context. And so, now maybe that's just because you know, his fans already know where he's coming from, but whereas I was trying to explain the Austrian position, and then I had sort of had to you know, bring up what, what the MMT's uh, position was. So anyway, I guess what I'm saying is the difference between this debate versus the Carl Smith one is Carl Smith did exactly what I was expecting him to do, where he came in, explained his background, his theoretical view of the economy, and then explained why his policy proposals followed from that. And then we ex you know, exchanged a cordial debate on those terms, whereas Moser just showed up and fired off a bunch of policy proposals and didn't give it his background. So normally that, that should hurt him, but I'm just saying I wasn't expecting him to do that. So just uh, keep that in mind if you ever are debating someone like, like don't, it, don't get phased if they don't do exactly what you want. You got to be able to just adapt. And then especially if you think you've got a real zinger of an analogy and then they use an analogy that hurts their position even more than yours, just take it in stride. Don't be, don't be surprised. They say, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, let's see. Got a few more minutes. Uh, David Friedman. So I debated David Friedman at Porkfest, which is the short for the Porcupine Freedom Festival. So this was uh, in June also, this was, yeah, mid-June. And here the, the topic was we discussed over email, you know, because the, the moderator, not the moderator, but the, the guy running Porkfest, he and his wife, obviously that, that would look good for Porkfest to try to get attendees to come to say, hey, an Austrian versus a Chicago school economist are, are debating, and also that we're both anarcho-capitalists. And, and a lot of the people who go to this, this festival uh, are anarcho-capitalists, and so we thought, oh, this would be good. You know, people would be interested in seeing this. And so the, what we were supposed to talk about, and this was over email and it was in the program, was uh, methodology, so in terms of Austrian economics versus Chicago, the Chicago school approach, so what are the main methodological differences, but then also our different justifications for our beliefs in anarcho-capitalism. And so Friedman comes at it from a sort of utilitarian consequentialist perspective, whereas I'm coming at it from a natural rights Rothbardian perspective. So those were the two things we were gonna talk about. So part of what happens if you go, I, I don't think it's available yet, but it was recorded and they tell me they're gonna put it up eventually. It's just they, they have to do editing and so forth. So. Uh, one thing that happened early on, and again, I'm just bringing this up just so you're prepared as you go out into the, onto the battlefield yourself, you don't get thrown, is right away, you know, he gave his opening statement, I think he went first, then I went, and then his initial response to me was to say, I don't know why Dr. Murphy is, is conflating, uh, you know, economic methodology with uh, anarcho-capitalist policy prescriptions or, view, or perspective, because that, you know, that involves value judgment, so he's, he's mixing up the positive and the normative. And you know, I just I just responded and I said, well, I'm I'm just doing what the brochure said we're gonna we're gonna debate. You know, I'm and I, I even think I got sarcastic and said I can chew gum too while I'm doing these, these two separate things. Because you know, in other words, he was implying that we can only do one versus the other. So anyway, that I'm just saying that that when you watch it, that's partly what, what happened is he thought we were talking about one thing and I thought we were talking about two things. So then the debate from that point centered on Austrian methodology. And let me um, so let me give the, the 
point that I made. So I said, as you guys probably know, the, the Chicago school thinks that empiricism is necessary, that in order to be truly scientific, you know, we can't just make up these conjectures and just think that they're right. We need, we need to have some sort of external test as a check upon our reasoning, and, you know, to, to weed out the bad theories from the good ones, and that's how economics should proceed. And in that sense, it's qualitatively the same as, as the other natural sciences. And so I said that actually um, I subscribe to the Misesian view that economic law or economic principles should be a priori, and I said that and that strikes a lot of people as quaint and medieval, but I made an analogy to geometry. And I said, look, when it comes to geometry, how, how, do you, how does that work? And even just basic stuff, like what you would teach uh, an intro class, you know, teaching the Pythagorean theorem or something. I mean, geometry works, you start with basic axioms and definitions, and then you deduce things step by step, and then you get the conclusion. As long as your deductions were valid, your steps were valid, then the answer is necessarily true, assuming that you agree that the axioms are true. And that's the way it works. And I said, in particular, if the teacher gave homework assignment to explain you know, the Pythagorean theorem, to prove the Pythagorean theorem, and then a student turned in and said, oh, you know what, I took a ruler and a compass and I went out and I measured 1,000 triangles, and in 998 of them, the Pythagorean theorem seemed correct, and the other two where it seemed like it was wrong, I went and took a second look, and actually one of them wasn't really a right triangle, you know, I, I looked at it better, okay, and then the other one wasn't really a triangle at all because they, they, you know, I looked real closely under a magnifying glass and the, you know, it was like this instead of coming to a point. And so uh, it turns out that I'm saying, yep, the, the Pythagorean theorem, to the best of my knowledge, is, is true, that I haven't been able to falsify it. So if somebody did that, right, that would be totally wrong. And, they, and it would be the teacher's job to explain to the poor kid, no, 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 you have totally misunderstood how we prove things in mathematics. And they would just you know, walk through that that's, you're, you're totally missing the boat. And, and yet, even though that is what we do in, ge in geometry and mathematics in general, nobody would say, well, we're just playing word games or we're just walking around in circles with our own definitions. We're not gaining any real information about the real world. You know, that it's, what, someone might say, what's the point then of proven uh, theorems in geometry, right? If all we do is end up with just as much information as we had at the beginning, if we're just taking our own assumptions and rearranging them to spit out a conclusion, what's the point? This is a huge waste of time let me go out and start observing reality and learning something new about the universe, right? If somebody said that as to why it would be a waste of time to study geometry, that would be silly, or even mathematics in general. And yet, that's exactly what people say about the Misesian notion of praxeology, that they're, they're saying, well, that can't, if, if you don't have empiricism that gets in somewhere, then it's, it's completely useless. So that was the point I made. And then, and Friedman, I didn't think it was a very, good response, he just said something like, uh, I'm really surprised that Dr. Murphy doesn't know that for decades now, physicists have known that the, the universe actually isn't Euclidean. And so I'm surprised he would make such a silly mistake in his statement. All right, so what, what he means, to make sure you understand, what he's saying is that uh, physicists think that the way space-time is right now, that it's actually not, the axioms of Euclidean geometry are not true, and so that the but they're approximately true. And so if you're, you know, if you're not near something that's really massive or if you're not going near the speed of light, then everything that's, that's true in you know, geometry that you might conclude based on the stuff you learned as a kid, that's roughly true, and so that's a good approximation, but we actually know in reality it's not quite like that. So th that's a subtle little point, and that's fine, but again, that doesn't invalidate what I just said. Be they still teach Euclidean geometry in schools, and I'm pretty sure that David Friedman doesn't think they should stop teaching that. All right, so it's, I mean, if you really wanted to take that analogy further, what it would be is to say, you know, we're not sure that people act, and maybe under certain circumstances they don't act and so forth, but even so, that wouldn't change praxeology. That would just possibly change the applicability of it. It wouldn't change how we do praxeology in the same way, even given you know, the, the, the uncertainty about, okay, are these axioms of Euclidean geometry true? That doesn't change how we do geometry. It just changes, you know, okay, maybe we would wanna look for a different type of geometry in certain settings. So that was um, what happened there with the, the debate with David Friedman. Let me talk now about uh, last week I was, I testified before the Senate on uh, certain issues. So here, in terms of going into the battlefield, this, this certainly happened. Um, so it was 
it was the Environmental and Public Works Committee that was chaired by Senator Barbara Boxer, who to my knowledge is not an Austrian economist. <laughs> and uh, certainly not a libertarian with a capital L, uh, probably not even a small L. And so the, the issue was, and I'll just go over this very briefly, but it's what the government's doing is they're having these, uh, they pushed for a cap and trade bill, that didn't work. They're trying to push through a carbon tax uh, that doesn't look like it has public support either. So now what the government's doing is they're trying to regulate these outcomes. And so the Obama administration had a working group, so they, they picked you know, various experts from various fields, from the different departments of, that were, had relevant jurisdiction, EPA and things like that. And they came up with this working group that has been studying the issue of what's called the social cost of carbon. So what that is, it's in a, a Pagovian framework, if you're familiar with that, with negative externalities. The idea is if you emit a ton of CO2 that causes global warming, that causes a bunch of damages to people around the world that aren't party to that original transaction, so it's a market failure. And so the social cost of carbon is quantifying those damages. And then they're saying these federal regulations, the working group released an estimate of the number, so it would be, it was like $38 a ton for 2015. So the idea is when federal agencies pass regulations and they have to, they're supposed to do a cost benefit analysis because they're gonna be able to show, look at we're good bureaucrats, we're only p passing uh, regulations that provide more benefits than costs, that's the idea. So in order to do that, so if a certain regulation like fuel economy standards, right, if they say automobiles have to get better mileage, they wanna be able to, to quantify the benefits and costs of that. So if they, if they predict, oh, that will lead to lower emissions, they need to be able to put a number on that. So the social cost of carbon is saying, oh, this is the number you multiply by the reduction in emissions for that year. All right, so that's what the context was. That's why I was there on this panel to testify, because I've studied that stuff. And so I, uh, I just pointed out that all I did was read the working group report. And that's the thing, when I got into this, because I work for the Institute for Energy Research, that's the capacity in which I do all this kind of work, I was thinking in order to challenge the government's case for more taxes or more regulations based on climate change, I thought I was gonna have to go out to like some you know, independent fringe estimates and say, oh wait a minute, but according to these scientists, this is the thing. And that's actually not what happened in practice. All I have to do is read the government's own reports past the executive summary, and all you need, all, you know, all of my smoking gun uh, revelations all come right from the government's own reports because the stuff they're doing is so crazy that even on their own terms, they have to do all these little tricks just to even try to justify what they're doing, if that, if that makes sense. So let me preface this uh, when I make this point. Some of you are probably gonna think, like, okay, Bob, but you're, you, why are you putting so much emphasis on the rules that are promulgated by the federal government about how cost benefits should be done? That's kind of silly. Well, what I'm gonna do in a second here, it's kind of analogous to Tom Woods when he you know, would get up in front of a Rothbardian crowd and talk about his book, Who Killed the Constitution? And he would be a little bit, sheepish about it because you say, I know a lot of you read Little Sanders Spooner and you agree with that, that you know, we shouldn't care about the Constitution, that it doesn't have any moral right over me, but he's saying it's just funny when the government officials all promise they're gonna obey it and then they routinely violate it, it's not even close, just to hear them, how, how do they justify that? It's just, it's, it's funny. And so it's the same thing here where the, um, the official guidelines that are in place for how agencies are supposed to do these cost benefit things, they don't even come close to obeying them. So there's, let me just give you, uh, one quick example. So in these models, the, um, believe it or not, the, they, the, the working group chose three, three of the models from the literature. And one of them shows benefits from modest global warming up through about 2.7 degrees Celsius. And so that works out to about, through about the year 2055, 2060, something like that. All right. So let me say that again. You've probably been taught that, oh, all the consensus and the experts tell you we're having right now experiencing these catastrophes and it's only going to get worse and that's why we need to take immediate action. And I'm saying the, one of the models that the government's own agency picked to study that shows that, well, no, there's actually net benefits from global warming for the next several decades. And it's only at that point on that it gets really bad. Now, in these computer simulations, to come up with this number that they just announced in May that's going to guide agencies, they run the simulations through the year 2300. And a lot of the alleged damages from climate change that are guiding current policy are happening well into the future. Right? So they have things like 25% of global output is forfeited 
with 10 degrees of warming, but then, you know, that's not going to happen until past the year 2200. All right, so just on the surface of it, you can see how extraordinary that is. That would be like if you know, people in the 1700s were making decisions based on what they thought our technological abilities today would be. You know, and that would, that would just be crazy. Just to give you an example, in the early 1900s, there were serious um, worries written by public officials about what are we going to do? We need to stem population growth in our major cities because if trends continue, they're going to be buried under horse manure, right? Because that's how they move stuff around back then before the automobile came on the scene. And so they were just projecting and saying, well, you know, we can't deal with it. So that's, I think, analogous to what's going to happen, that, you know, in the year 2250, if they really needed to, I'm sure humans at that point could figure out a way to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere if, if that was something that was really an important issue at that time. Okay, so I was going through things like that. Now, because that's the nature of the situation, that there's upfront benefits followed by hundreds of years of costs in their standard framework in terms of externalities, to come up with a number today, you have to choose a discount rate, right, to figure out how we're gonna value that stream of benefits and then costs. And so you can think about it, the, the, uh, the discount rate you choose can have a huge impact. And so I'm just explaining this to the, you only got five minutes, I'm explaining this to the Senate committee. And, and I said, so using their own numbers, if it's at a 5% discount rate, then they're saying the social cost of carbon is $11 a ton. If we drop it down to a 2.5% discount, discount rate, the social cost of carbon more than quadruples to $52 a ton. I'm saying, so I'm not you know, looking at different climate models. Right? This is all the same model, all the same output. The only thing I'm changing there is the discount rate we decide to apply to that flow of projected damages and benefits. And so, like I said, just tweaking it from 5% down to 2.5% can more than quadruple the number. And again, that, the reason that number is important is that's what federal agencies are using to regulate businesses and households. So I, I was pointing it out, and I said, so in this context, it's very significant that the Office of Management and Budget said they're supposed to use a 7% discount rate when they report these things, that you, you can use other ones, but you're all supposed to use a 7, and the working group ignored that. They didn't do it. They, they even quoted the regulation, then explained why they weren't going to do it. And, I, and then I speculated, and I said, I think the reason they did that is that if they used a 7% discount rate, the social cost of carbon would be around zero or possibly even negative. We don't know, you know, because we're emailing them trying to get the numbers, and they said they didn't, they didn't keep them. So that's, because, <laughs> um, you know, the, the government doesn't have that much money right now, so they you know, wouldn't have, to keep a bunch of records would be expensive. So, so the point was, again, you know, all their rhetoric and everything, it's amazing that even using their own models, stipulating all the climate models, and you know, we all know the, the potential problems with all that stuff, I'm saying if I just used the discount rate that the OMB said should be used in these types of analyses, or at least reported, all of a sudden the federal government should be subsidizing coal-fired power plants because they benefit humanity, <laughs> right? Because that's what a negative social cost of carbon would mean. And so, of course, they, they didn't like that. And um, <laughs> so anyway, what, it was, what was great, though, and just so you know, so they get up and they start talk, not saying a word about my arguments, just questioning, you know, the group that had me there and where their funding sources and that sort of thing. And I kind of just assumed they were, after they slandered me in front of, you know, the four people who were watching this thing online, that they were going to then, you know, give me a chance to respond. And no, they didn't. They just, they just moved on. So um, just, just be careful if you go and testify before Barbara Boxer. She doesn't play fair. Um, <laughs> so also, too, that this episode was, that was the, the biggest hit piece that has ever been written on, on me. Uh, some of our senior faculty here are quite familiar with hit pieces, but this was the first time it happened to me. So that's kind of knew, you know, it was in the Huffington Post, and it was, you know, someone just going through and just reading that, you would think I was the worst person imaginable. And it, it's, you know, by, by, the, by the end of it, I was like, everybody, say goodnight to the bad guy, huh, you know? <laughs> Let me tell you something. I know these climate models more than you. Let me tell you something. All right, so, um, I started out doing Scarface, and I don't know what I turned into there by the end of that. Um, so, let me just say that as a lesson from that, though, and I mean this sincerely, is until you've seen a hit piece like that that's written either on you or somebody you know personally, they don't even need to lie. They can make technically true statements about the person and like quote things they've said, but just paint a completely misleading image. So just keep that in mind the next time like you form your opinion on someone based on some, you know, some uh, reporter's uh, assessment that you can you can paint a totally misleading picture about somebody without technically lying. All right, we got just a couple more minutes left, so I think people are expecting me to talk about 
a debate that has yet to occur. So this is the, um, that's a caricature, by the way. <laughs> um, Krugman, Krugman's beard actually isn't that fluffy. Um, so this is uh, what The Economist did. There was a piece on alternative schools of thought. And, uh, and so they were, you know, they, were, they weren't just talking about the Austrians, but they, they did mention the Austrians. So this was it. So I wasn't named in the piece, but the, the art, they kind of like gave me a little bit of a nod with, with this. Also, just so you know, at first I thought like I was swinging and about to like sort of hit him from behind, and that would have been not, not very gentlemanly. But someone pointed out, they said, no, they said, Bob, what you're doing is you're tapping him on the shoulder. And you, if you look at it, you can see that is, actually is what the artist was, was trying to capture there, so, you know, saying like, hey, why don't you turn around, let's fight. So um, anyway, the, the, the Krugman debate, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, people always ask me about that. It had gotten up to about $109,000 was the last I had seen. And uh, the official position Krugman did officially, go, he was on a radio show and somebody kind of ambushed him and called in and said, hey, Dr. Krugman, how come you don't debate this guy, Robert Murphy? The Austrians, I think, made a lot of good, you know, they called this recession and da, 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 da. And Krugman just, you know, said, hey, this is a serious policy issue. I'm not gonna give a platform to these people who wanna turn it into a circus. And, you know, that was, that was his thing. But ironically, I mean, he had just, you know, like a week later, he went off and, and went on the talk shows to promote his book and was debating guys on CNBC and, and so forth. So um, I, I think that he, he actually was not being entirely honest with that answer. Okay, so I guess the, um, the lessons from my experiences are make sure, as Gary North said, that you choose your audience, don't lose, and um, also if, if you have to get famous, then go ahead and go topless. All right, thanks everybody. <laughs>